Under the Hood Show is heard weekly on this and other great radio stations across the U.S. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. Have a great day, and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go under the hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood show from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood show. Glad to have you with us. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Thanks for joining us, Under the Hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. And while we were setting up to start this hour of the show, Wayne from Georgia sat on hold the whole time. So let's go right to Wayne and say, hi, Wayne, you're on the Under the Hood show. What can we do for you? Yeah. Hello. How y'all doing? Fantastic, Wayne. Thanks for calling. Yes, I love y'all's show. And uh, yes, I have a 2016 Acura. PLS. And I have uh, received a letter from them. It's an Acura work extension. And I just wonder if y'all had heard anything about that. It's for the uh, automatic transmission fluid warmer. And they said that if it goes bad, that they will replace my engine and transmission. And they give me a 10 uh, year and unlimited mileage on the, uh, on this. I just wonder if y'all heard anything about that. Well, before we go into the details of what you got, I just want to use this opportunity to for, to tell our hoodies about something else. If you get a letter in the mail, we've talked about this before, but I just think it's never we can't say it enough. And it comes and it talks about extending your warranty. Something's about to run out. Um, some of them even have like emergency symbols on them and they're very, very deceptive. I don't think the one you have is, I'm, we're going to get back to that. But if it doesn't say on the document from American Honda or from Jeep Chrysler or from, you know, whatever the manufacturer might happen to be, it's most likely somebody trying to market you to sell you some sort of extended service. Mm -hmm. And they're not affiliated with, they've just got into a database and found that your vehicle's out there and they're trying to sell you something a lot of times. So always be very mindful because I do know I've got friends, employees, they see this stuff and they're triggered by it. And so they start reacting and they're digging in and, and, and then you come to find out when you talk to them like, no, this is, you can throw this in the garbage can. Uh, unless you're really looking to spend $3,000 right now on an extended warranty or something that you don't need this right now. And uh, they're like, oh, okay, all right. I was worried about it. You know, and then they had this whole little day and a half in their life where they're all excited and worried. And right. It was all for not. So that's just some advice for our hoodies. Now, back to what you've got. Um, can you yeah. tell me again, you said it was an Definitely. automatic transmission cooler? No, automatic transmission fluid warmer. Warmer. Okay. So here's yeah, what I, here's, I don't know. It will, it will. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I just going to say, I, I think I know what's going on here. If this is the factory deal, they've found that in some occasional cases, they've got an item, and it must be a warmer they put on there to, to get the fluid, you know, viscosity warmed up before the car gets too deep in his run cycle to help prevent damage to the components, just gets fluid flowing quicker. Similar to the radiator with the transmission fluid cooler flowing through it. Right. Seems like a good idea. Yeah, this, in this case, a heater. Uh, they are saying, all right, we've run into a very few of these that have had problems. And apparently the problem that they have must affect the cooling system on the engine also or well, something. If, the, if it were to break, you could get oil into the Contamination engine. Contamination and damage your engine. Into the so, trans. so they're saying, it, we, we don't think we need to go out and replace all these things. Mm -hmm. We've just taken the route that we're going to extend the warranty out and 
give you extra protection and extra coverage. And if you have that problem, we're going to take care of it because there's so few that are going to have the problem, Mm -hmm. which is a route you'll see taking quite a bit. And it's also part of a lot of class settlements where they've been sued by a class action. And to settle with the class, they come up with some of these things for solutions. So what I would recommend you do is you call or contact, email, whatever your favorite method is, an Acura dealer, factory dealer, and give them your VIN number and then discuss the campaign with them. Mm-hmm. And then make sure you understand it. And, and then in many cases, they can check your VIN number and see if you're well, in the... VIN the... number is actually, Go ahead. is actually on the document that I got. Yep. My VIN number. That, and, that, and that is good because they not only know that you have that car, they know which car you have. Right. And they're not wanting to charge you yeah, anything yeah. for any of this, right? No, no, no charge at all. It's all uh, free of charge. If they give three options. They said the vehicle overheats, the transmission shifts poorly, or the transmission jerks between third and fourth gear. Wayne, have you had any issues with any of that up until now? No, I have not. It's been an excellent car. All I've done is change oil and battery, and that's it. That's the whole and, and be honest with me, do you kind of hope you're going to have a little bit of a problem now so they have to replace the entire thing? <laughs> for free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I have a problem with it. Free is good. Free is good. Uh, Chris, that's funny because there are times where you get something in the mail like that. Because I see a lot of them here at our auto recycling facility. I'm like, huh, eh, it's got 80,000 miles on it. They want to put a new transmission in it. I'm probably game. <laughs> well, and I had I had this exact same thing on a car we had once. It was a little bit older, and it they they said the same thing. I'd get the extended warranty or replacement. I could bring it into the dealer. And when the dealer got the VIN number and looked at the vehicle, they were able to just tell me, oh, no, this yours doesn't fall into it. It's not relevant. Your part, your car doesn't have that piece that they're talking about, so don't even worry about it. So, Wayne, yeah, if you, if you talk to your Acura dealer or bring it in, they'll be able to help you and explain that. It is, it's a, a nice thing to kind of get. I mean, although it told Wayne now that there's a problem with that. <laughs> I just got one for our son's 2014 model pickup and it's a an alert kind of thing and I'm like I looked at it right away and I've seen one before I'm like uh, maybe maybe not and but they had a they had a VIN number hidden on the front of it and we have a computer system thank goodness so we were able to look it up and and see oh yeah that's Riley's truck and then what we found out is that there's a concern on certain models about brake pedal pressure and feel and so they want it to be inspected and see if I have the particular one with the problem so Wayne, thanks very much for the call. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. Six five nine four four one five zero From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is... The Under the Hood Show. Now let's go to Wyoming and talk to Dwayne. Dwayne, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Well, I've got uh, a 2004 F-150 that uh, I've got like 180, some about 180,000 miles on it. And um, it started to um, um, chug. When you're going down the road uh, uh, coasting, um, it doesn't matter whether it's in uh, in the uh, cruise control or not. Uh, it's kind of acting like it's um, not firing, uh, but, uh, but it's it's not throwing a code. It won't throw a code. It won't throw uh, anything. So I have none of the mechanics want to even touch it. Um, it's uh, when I'm pulling, like when I'm driving to work, uh, I'm going uphill and. Uh, the uh, it, it doesn't miss at all. But when I'm coming home and I've got the cruise set, it sits there and just uh, acts like it's just chugging. Uh, you know, and not not bad, but I can feel it. And um, I just wanted to know if, if you guys had had any other um, um, uh, people calling in about something like that uh, after it gets so many thousand miles on that five four or. I can't tell whether it's a firing uh, problem or a uh, gas fuel problem or a transmission problem. 
And none of the mechanics, like I say, will, will touch it until um, it throws a code. And it hasn't thrown a code yet, but uh, I was just curious. Did they even drive it to see what it feels like? No, sir, they haven't. Uh, uh, it, I, I've stopped in and talked to them, and they, they said, well, unless it throws a code, we, you know, we, 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 don't, we can't. We're not going to be able to do anything with it. No, I, I think they're so. nuts. I mean, for me, <laughs> if you brought it into my shop, if you tell me, well, there's no light on, so there's no code, and it's not doing it right now, yeah, I'm going to send you away. I'm going to say, I can't do anything while it's not doing it. But if you tell me, no, you go out and set the cruise right now, and you're going to feel it. You're going to see what's going on. I'm at least going to humor everybody and get in the truck and drive it, and I might drive and go, oh, oh, yeah, I, I think I know what's going on here. Of course it's not going to set a code because it's, your drive shaft is loose. It's ready to fall off. That's what the feeling is. <laughs> Your wheels are loose, and it's a little it's a little squirrelier. There's a suspension. All hyperbole at this point. You know, I mean, it could be anything. You could have a loose tie rod end, and when you're going and you're in between load and unload and everything's just kind of floating around, you might have a, a wheel or something just flop around. You've got to at least check it. Let's go simple here. I mean, could he have just coil boots and stuff that are misfiring and not throw a code? He yeah. Easily. It, could, it could be small Under a light that, load? Of course. They do that all the time. We have some of them that are missing quite heavily going down the road like that, but they don't miss that idle and they don't throw a code. They just never throw that code at, for that. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't. You asked if people call the show about this. If, if you've if you've listened and paid attention to F-150 calls for the last 10 years, you've heard us talk a lot about some more major problems with these engines, with the timing set and the, the, the cam phasers and this sort of stuff. Which are, Harv called last week with an F-150. Which are a result of missed. oiling issues as they get older and they don't keep enough pressure in the phasers. You know, that, that's been a, a thing. But what you're describing doesn't sound like that. And so we do also talk to a lot of people about ignition, secondary ignition problems, which is... Uh, coils and boots on those on those units and if it's 180,000 miles and you don't know the last time that you put coils boots plugs on that engine there's a high probability that's what's going on it's something that simple uh, I, I've put uh, I've changed the plugs at uh, 75,000 and 150,000 and I put uh, new boots on at about 160,000 okay put new coils and stuff uh, now they were from the uh, O'Reilly store they, they weren't uh, um, OEM, but uh, they were, I can't remember uh, what they recommended, but still good um, parts. They, 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 yeah, they seem to, I mean, it seemed to work good after that. And it, uh, I've got, a, I've got, when I pull up to a stop sign, I got kind of a vibration. I don't know whether that's a, uh, I mean, you, whether it's a, a, a shield or whether it's something in the transmission um, that's vibrating. And, and once you, well, you know, once you let off the brake and you take off, it it, it goes away. But uh, as soon as you pull up and, and and then you pop it into neutral and it'll go away. Uh, so that's what tends to make me believe that it's a transmission problem of some kind. And uh, so it's possible. You, but mechanics got to get in that thing and and drive it if it's doing it, so they can feel it. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah because not everything is about a code. If you tell them you have a vibration going down the road. Maybe do that. Just go and say, hey, I got this vibration going down the road and ride with them. And that's not going to turn a light on. And they know that. So maybe at least they'll get in the vehicle and ride with you down the road and say, there it is. Is this something where like a tech, I mean, you wouldn't be able to pinpoint it, but you would be able to go, oh, that feels like this or it feels like it could yeah. be that. Let's check these and couple things. You got to get the right tech. So many places just they, they employ a multitude of techs and you could have the right guy working for that company. But if they don't get in the car and ride in it, right. you know, if you, you throw the guy in that is good at uh, wheel bearings, let's say, and you, you throw him in there for a misfire thing, he's going to go, I don't know what that is. And you throw the misfire guy in there for the, you know, front end alignment thing, and you're like, uh, no, I'm not familiar with that. They just got to put the right people with the right thing or be do the right thing and and not have them go for that test drive. Russ, I got a hunch here what's going on. I really do. I think that he went to a shop, told them the conditions. They assumed it was going to be a Pandora's box, and it could end up being the fact that they're going to have to be telling this guy they got to spend a bunch of money and replace his engine, and they didn't really want to get involved for whatever the situation was, and they took a poor route and, and just told them that they didn't want to figure it out. Possible. And that's – me that's not good business good business should be just tell it like it is or or get in and, and analyze it and say you know what after they drove it 
I think we're, it's worth checking into this. I, I think it's worth checking into this, but I'm afraid it could be this. And I've learned that too. So we'll have somebody call up and say, I have, let's just throw something really crazy out there. I have a BMW and it's doing this. And in my mind, I'm thinking, we don't work on that particular thing it's doing. Like, I'm going to find, I'm just going to go for a ride anyways and see, because I may know what it is, even if we don't make the repairs. But I found that more than half the time, it's not what I thought it was. And it is something that we can repair. So I might as well have looked at it in the first place yep. so that we can I, I fix think, the car. I think somebody's mind may have created a barrier that they didn't want to cross, and you became the victim of somebody that didn't want to dig into it. Dwayne, sorry about that. <laughs> but good luck. I mean, now you've got a direction to go back. Thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Mike. You're on the end of the hood show, Mike. What can we do for you? I got a new truck, and I'm wondering about getting it undercoated. Is it a good thing to do or not? I had my last truck undercoated. That was a 98 Chevy. And it's starting to rust through at uh, 23 years old. I just don't know why. <laughs> well, I've got a, I know I've mentioned this car in the show before. I have a 79 Trans Am that only has 1,900 actual miles on it. And when it was new, somebody did the undercoating underneath of it. Now, this car has been in climate control storage, so it's not an example. But that type of undercoating is still done today. But there's another type of undercoating that's being done nowadays that is quite popular with fleets and commercial vehicles. And actually, one of our partners that we've had on the show advertising. Just lo locally here in our local market is Dakota Rust Proofing. And they do undercoating. Uh, basically, it's a rust, rust proofing, undercoating. A rust inhibitor. Yeah, on these vehicles, uh, fleet vehicles. If you've got something that's being used like a snow plow or something where you've got a sander on the back of it with salt. Uh, these things will get eaten up, and a lot of the counties and stuff around here started to use that to protect their vehicles, and it works very well. If Dakota Rust Proofing is lim listening, I'd like to go down and see them do that. I think that'd be neat. And I mean, if I, they, yeah. I have a, I mean, just for the example, they could put my. Yeah, car no, up it's there. a liquid that they put on, <laughs> and it, it it's not a lifetime application. You and have they actually have some now that are uh, there's an oil base to it that repels rodents. The rodents don't like okay. it. Okay, that's so the people that are looking to get rid so of. So in Mike's, Mike's case, what kind of what what is he asking? I mean, the the typical old type of undercoating, whatever. But this the new, heavy tar. What are we looking? <laughs> yeah, what are we looking at? What does he want to ask for? Who is he looking for? You know, we probably should ask a couple more questions, but we were both excited to tell you about because we just <laughs> yeah. we just learned about this new technology because it came from like Canada and and up north where they have a lot of problems with corrosion. You should call Dakota Rust Proofing in Ex Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Yeah, and they get give their us some information. Opinion. So, what kind of truck you got? I just got a thirty five hundred Chevy crew cab. Okay, all right. Yeah, and you don't. You don't see, and we don't see people with that that type of a vehicle spraying the bottoms with the with the heavy, uh, thick, uh, typical undercoating you imagine back from the day if you've ever been involved in undercoating. Mm -hmm. uh, you just don't see that anymore. I've seen the new rust proofing examples on vehicles, and I know it's on there because you'll look under a car when we're doing some repairs that's four or five years old, and you'll see some stripes where somebody maybe didn't do a great job on it. You know, who knows where these things have come from and they'll be spraying. And if they cover part of a metal frame and the other part gets missed, you'll see a little stripe of rust on there. So you know that they've been protected with something, but it's not the traditional tar that goes on these, on these vehicles. Yeah. I would research this because the, the, the metal and corrosion protection on vehicles has gotten better. It has gotten better than okay. it used to be. Mm -hmm. The corrosion protection on a 2021 Silverado is going to be way better than the corrosion protection on your, what, what year did you say, 1990, what? Eight. 98. Eight. Yeah, 98 Chevy okay. pickup. So if I live in Colorado Springs right now, what am I Googling or looking up in the yellow pages? What Rust proofing? Rust, rust proofing, general? rust inhibitors. Okay. Yep. And then calling and getting a little yep. more yep. information about what they're doing. Yeah, because the gentleman that's Dakota Rust Proofing here in, in our market, you know, his product is a product that is uh, patented, but it's a product that's available that other distributors are putting in other parts of the country also. Yeah, nation, yeah. So it's something that uh, somebody is doing in another market I'll, if they've got a rust 
belt area also. Are, do you know if dealers are doing it yet? Are they doing it when they offer you the undercoat? Or is that There's a lot of services offered, and I guess I would have to look and see what dealers are doing what. Okay. Mike, thanks very much for the call. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. Six six five nine four four one five zero from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. And if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and join the Hoodie Fan Club at UnderTheHoodShow.com, you could surprise. You could be surprised with a hoodie showing up at your door. Like Gabrielle Collins from Pittsfield, Illinois. Congratulations from all of us here under the hood. They said they listen locally on the radio there, and they follow up and watch us on YouTube if nice. anything they, they miss. Will, will an actual person in a hoodie show up, or will it just be the hoodie? That, I think that would Are be... Are we talking about the, in, the, the fan of the show, the complete hoodie? Yeah, we're just going to show up with the hoodie and give it to them right off our back. I think that would be poor marketing. If we actually had a random just listener? Ran, just, yeah, just, you know, gig economy, pay someone to go over there and... Hey, Hoodie John, go, go just show up. There's some guy at our door. I don't think that would be. You don't want a previous ideal. used hoodie, you know. We, well, no, I'm just wondering if the person would stay. No. no oh, no, no. like they're you, it, giving him a hoodie. Yeah, it's a hoodie. It's like just, yeah, he eats it's like a Wayne person. from Georgia. Right. He's a fan. Yeah, he just shows up. He's over there for the I summer hope, now. Hope so. they don't show up delivering it to you if if it's off their back in their in their ATV. Because I saw a UTV this morning. We're talking about like we've talked about personalized plates that are weird before in the show. <laughs> yeah. You folks all. I'm just going to give you this number before we talk to you about our friends over at Universal Technical Institute. This plate reads X T R A B O. Hmm, that's uh. You don't want them delivering your I hoodie that. off their back. I don't think I want their hoodie. Uh-uh. What do you think they're trying to say with a license plate that says? Was it a Mercure? Oh no, that was the XRT. <laughs> no, this is a this is extra a, something. A side by side. It's yeah. extra something. That's I'm, just too obvious, isn't it? Extra bo. I extra don't know. Extra bo. What if your What if it was a gift from her husband and he put that on her? And it was Bo personalized plate. And it was extra for Bo. <laughs> they just gave it to Bo. Anyway, Maybe let's talk about uh, what, what kind of vehicle was it on? It was a side by side. But you know what? What brand? Uh, Polaris. Was it, was it jacked up or anything? No, or it's a Polaris. It had a lot of lights on it. A lot of lights. <laughs> Well, you're going to have me thinking about that one. <laughs> this is just really odd. It was a very older person, you okay. know, my age, driving it, maybe older. Anyways, Universal Technical <laughs> Institute. Oh, I want to go visit. I want to go visit the Marine Institute. Mm-hmm. I mean, the car thing is cool, too, to me, but I've I'm, I'm really always been a fan of the boat, so I want, to, I want to go check out their Marine Institute, see what's going on the there. NASCAR. Yeah, the current stuff. Oh, NASCAR <laughs> tech. uh But they've got welding training, they've got automotive training, collision repair, all sorts of vehicle specialty divisions with trainers and campuses all over the country. Great camaraderie between the manufacturers and the technicians and the teachers. It's a great place to go. Financial aid available. Check out uti.edu, uti.edu for more info. NASCAR, just think about this for a second. I'm just going to go off on one more tangent. The guys that are, the crew chiefs got ready to go over the wall after a crash that have got the perfectly cut piece of front nose they've taken off of their section in the back, and they've got the 200-mile-an-hour tape on it ready to go, the rivet gun ready to go. Are they learning that at UTI, or is that, a, is that an in-house oh, that's a good skunk question. works where they just practice figuring out? Because that would be crazy to, to be the one that figures out what can we engineer on the spot. You've got to teach it but you've also got to just feel it and know it. Chris's son is a pilot, and he's a damn good one, but he didn't learn that. He was born with it. He just had it in him to do it. The way he was telling me he was doing things, I said, Mm -hmm. nope. I said, he just knows it. He just feels it and does it. Same way he played hockey. He was a great hockey player because he could just do it. He could just visualize the stuff coming at him and do it with cars, when you work on them, I got a guy that works for us and well, everybody at our shop now, when they're working on cars, we tell them, don't look at the computer to learn how to take stuff apart. Just look at the vehicle, take it oh, apart. Sure. Every car is nuts and bolts and wire connectors, period. Don't look at the screen and say, 
if A, do this, if B, do this, then follow around to C, and then go back to the beginning and then replace the computer. It's always replace the computer at the end. It's like, but I'm putting a transmission in. doesn't matter. Computer's bad. <laughs> You've just got to visualize those things. And these guys look at the cars coming around turn three, and they're like, oh, yeah, look. Oh, look on the camera. He's missing this. It goes over to the end of the Under the Hood Show sticker on the front bumper. So it's a, ours on the wall here. Get the tin snips. <laughs> Cut it out. Tape. <laughs> Boom, they put it on, they're visualizing it. Yep, that no, it's, kind of it's stuff. awesome, and, and that's exactly oh. what it is, I'm sure. But it's just, to me, that's kind of amazing that, that on the spot engineering that they have to do. Right. Uh, it, it comes from a lot of years of paying attention there, and It looks like the cars are just going round and round, but when you're actually on the track or sitting up on top of the toolbox watching, it's a whole different thing. And I could, you just get that feeling for what these guys are doing it's not just going round and round one 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 last thing on this and i'm done and you guys can keep going if you want but i'll be done nascar the bristol motor speedway you talked about the dirt race red mm-hmm. dirt they ran track speeds around 88 miles an hour with the nascar cars wasn't that about do you remember I that chris so, yeah the world of outlaws was just there with the sprint cars they broke the track record on dirt 146 Jeez. miles an hour average around the track and I think that the the first night, the record was set by David Gravel. I don't know how I think that's how you say his name, but his car is connected to and sponsored by Houston Speedway, which will re- okay. re- reopen back up under its original name this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he won and swept the races at Bristol, HoustonSpeedway.com on the car. That's cool. And so a uh, pretty excited group of people there involved with the owner, Todd Queering, and such. So That is interesting. So a Speedway sponsoring a car. I haven't seen that in a while. Yeah. Anyway, fun stuff. 866-594-4150. Let's go to Pennsylvania and talk to Don. You're on the end of the hood show. Don, what can we do for you? Hey, I have an 05 Cavalier, and I've had, it's been setting for two years. And I charged up the battery, went, started up, and I'm not getting a, either a pulse to the fuel pump, but the lockout was coming on quite a bit. So I got the, I disconnected battery, got it all reset, and started it, try to start it again, nothing. Check the relays, swap the, uh, I think it was the fan relay with a fuel pump because they were the same. Make sure that wasn't the problem. Check the fuse. Fuse isn't the problem. And I got nowhere. So I hooked up again the third time. And as soon as I hooked up, I heard the fuel pump actuate. And I'm like, now why didn't I get it the first 2,000 times that I tried this? <laughs> now why did I get 2,000. You know, why did I get it now? <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been working on this thing for a week or, or, or over. You know what I mean? I'm like, what the heck is going on here? Different charging devices, everything. I'm just fed up, and I know I listen to you guys every day on the podcast here. I said, you know, people say, why do you keep listening to that? I said, you know what? People that are smart listen to these guys. I'm pretty smart. So. <laughs> I, just, I, I still just laugh 2,000 times because that's how it feels when you're trying to do something like that and it's not working. And you mm-hmm. just keep doing it over and over and over again, expecting a different result. Yep. And in this case, exactly. you got one. <laughs> well, <laughs> one time and I left it run and it ran for, I left it run for like five minutes. And when I shut it off, went to restart it again, I got nothing. Oh, boy. So, what I don't know what would be triggering this to do this. I'm just throwing a shot in the dark. I, it, it's possible it could have a fuel pump issue going on with it. And when you're applying power to it, it's similar to pounding on the bottom of the tank trying to get it to crank. You're just bumping that. Oh, pump I've done around. that. Yep. And if, you know if that <laughs> yep. if that works, you're. It could be the pump. If if I was checking this after sitting this long, I'd probably take a get a voltmeter or something put on the on the pump itself in the back. And see if I have voltage. So when you turn the key on, for about three seconds, you'll have a fuel pump pulse. You'll have power back there, a battery voltage. And when you're cranking it and the oil pressure comes up, you're also going to see that. If you've got nothing, you've got to go diagnose through the security system, things like that, find out what's going on. But if you do have something and you still got no fuel pump, if there's no fuel pump pressure, then, then the pump is bad if you've got voltage back there. Yeah. Right, because the rail was had no pressure in it. You the- know what I mean? 
when I first started, the rail had no pressure. So I knew the pump wasn't even closed. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. So, well, um, but the lockout security, would that shut off the pulse over to the fuel pump? Yep. Yeah, it does. It shuts it. It shuts that down. So I'm just think an 05 Cavalier, did it have that security? Yeah, it should. In an 05, it should. It yeah. does. Okay, because I, I there's part of me was wondering all the time. Okay, there was part of me wondering if they never brought that to the end of the Cavalier life cycle and brought it in on the Cobalt life cycle. So I'll just I was just saying that out loud. I think it was in the newer in the in the generation that followed after the '98 style okay. Cavalier. All right. All right. So we had a few of them with security light on. Um, yeah, you know, I'd put I'd just start with a voltmeter back there, and we got to verify the basics. Do we have voltage back there at the pump or not? If we if we do, then we know the pump is failing. If we don't, then we know we've got to look elsewhere in the system. So Dan's thinking, all right, he wants me to check voltage back there. How in the heck do I get at the wires? Did that car, if it's you the crawl pigtail back there, but what's the pigtail. color? Yeah, I know where the pigtail is. Yeah, and you I know a, where the junction is, but I don't know what color the wire is. You got a black, gray, and purple back there, but you'll have to look up the the exact colors on the internet because right now I'm having one of those moments, and I can't remember which one was the sending unit and which one is the fuel pump at this very second here. Mark that down yeah, in we, your book. Yeah, he's hey, sli- you know. he's slipping. He's slipping. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> I've, I, I, I finally le- learned what it means when, when I was young and somebody says, hey, pay attention to that old guy. He's forgotten more things than you've learned to this point in your life. And I'm like, what? I'm for- I've forgotten a lot of stuff because you don't use it anymore. So you just go, I'm not going to use it. I need to file Don, that away. Don, thanks very much for the call. Good luck with that. 866-594-4150. Let's go to Kansas and talk to Blaze. Blaze, you're on the end of the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Yeah, guys. Um, I was, I had a, a couple questions. Um, one of them I called in before about the Altel scanner that I couldn't get to read on a 99. Sure. And I figured out the problem with it and I'm pretty sure that Russ says it a lot of different times and I had forgot about it, even though I'd heard it a bunch was put in the, go in and manually put in all the info instead yes. of having it do the auto scan, <clears throat> putting in all the all the required data and correct data. So that's where I messed up on the all tail, just being new and trying to learn about it. Um, I got in under control. My other question is I bought an 03 trailblazer that had been to a few different mechanics and hadn't had any uh, help with it. And they all blamed it on computer or electrical issue. Well, what I found with the voltmeter is checking battery or voltage down to the starter i was getting voltage down to the starter but it was draining the battery like i could watch it go 12 11 10 9 8 and usually rest about three or four volts just sucking the battery dry well i took off the starter and the uh the gear was broke off the starter so and it was just shaking down the line so the from what i could test with it the uh Solenoid was stuck on and draining the battery, and I had no gauges or anything in there because I think it was still trying to start and just going black. Does that sound? Uh, does that sound like something you've seen for one? I've got a starter and a starter relay coming because I know the starter's bad, but I didn't know if that sounded like something you guys had seen before because I haven't. I'm not not as not as much experience under my belt. Not if it's. Not cranking the engine. If Maybe. the end, it, you know, if the engine's not spinning over, um, and not cranking, then I, I, I'm not. I wouldn't see that. It could be supplying some voltage to that starter, but not engaging the solenoid completely. You know, it's possible the, that you're getting a little bit of voltage down there, but it uh, rusts. It po- typically. Do not. you know that the motor is not stuck? So I think it is. I think the starter. I think the starter solenoid stuck. Um, no, I'm, t- I'm so talking about the engine. It, is, I'm talking about the engine itself. Is the engine able to turn over physically? Yes, I could get it to start. It wouldn't start reliably. It would start as it would start as long as it stayed hooked up to another vehicle with jumper cables. Okay. But the starter spline was broke off of the was uh, just free floating. It didn't have anything. So when you'd hit the starter, oh. if it it would just it would just spin the the it wouldn't spin the gear it was just wearing on the the rod that the gear connects to 
Gotcha. And so when I'd hook up the battery, I always heard a clunk, but it didn't necessarily sound like a starter because it didn't sound, you know, like a 747 trying to land like a, like a hung starter. Yeah. And so. Okay. You, you just said something that made me it think. Pulling. Yes. If you've got a bad starter. So the solenoid, the way this thing works, a lot of people know how it works, but a lot of people don't. There is a electromagnet that is energized by battery voltage and it pulls a big metal bar towards two contacts. You've got the power coming in from your battery and then the power that needs to go to the starter. If you imagine taking a screwdriver and jumping across those contacts, it's going to spin like the old solenoid. For those of you who remember the old solenoid under the hood, you've got this magnet that's pulling a metal bar towards that and it's also, as it's pulling that, it's engaging the starter bendix. It's moving out. It's on a fulcrum. It's a little lever. It, it moves. So, Chris, you're picturing me here. Mm-hmm. It's moving, and it goes clunk, and the gear is engaged in the engine, and it makes the contact, spins the starter motor. If the solenoid is engaged, but something is broken and has prevented the teeth from getting all the way out into the flywheel and cranking that engine over, the solenoid can have full power engaged, but it's not engaging the motor, so it's going to be drawing a lot of current. That solenoid pulls a lot of amps. So how do you find out if that's what he the issue just is? did? He found out. He just told me that he found okay. that broken part in the starter. So I'd put the starter in it, put the starter relay in it because it's obviously been on and heated. But be prepared to disconnect your battery when you fire this thing up because it sounds like something's keeping the starter engaged. And that could be that starter relay that he's replacing. So he might put the starter in and the relay, and it might take care of all of it. Blaze, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show, 866-594-4150. Engines and transmissions in. After they call and say, oh, that much? Oh, my car's not worth half that. I'm like, let's Check. look it up. And yeah. they're like, whoa, it's worth that much? Well, it's worth that much if it's running. So why don't you put the trans in it and sell it? So the, the market right now for it's, vehicles is is high. Vehicles, boats, campers. Yeah. So if you are you know shopping, you want to bring in as many points of data as you can if you're looking for something. And, and that's why they really do a nice job with the way that's set up. The vehicles right now, we've got our market representative, Alan, who's been a part of our team for 30 years almost. Him and I are the same age, and we grew up together. And as he's out and about talking to different uh, used car lots, he, he joked with one of them when he walked in that's been there for a long time. It's a smaller lot, but he said, he goes, hey, this would be a great place to open up a car lot. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, they kind of laughed because they just – Inventory you is right. Yeah, and right now we have three cars from one dealer in our shop. They're being worked on, and they are calling I multiple bet. times every day. We need those back. We need them back. We need them back. Like if, we're waiting for parts. We're waiting for parts. <laughs> if you don't want to sell your car right now, don't go look at the value of your car. If you've got an extra though, now is the time yeah, to sell it yes. and then buy another one later. Right, because right? it's just like a house. Mm-hmm. If you have to replace what you sell, you got the same challenge on the other side. Eight You're, six. So, oh. I was just going to say, just keep, I just want to let everybody know that you might look up the market on your car if you're ready to sell it or thinking about selling it. Now would be the time. That's why you're seeing. But where that's it, also going to mean. You got to replace it. Yeah. Then be careful. But all across the country, you're probably seeing your dealerships and your car lots advertising. We want your car. That's why. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Joel. You're on the end of the hood show. Joel, what can we do for you? Well, I got a question. I got a 1996 S10 Blazer, 4.3 liter V6. And I can drive that thing for two, three weeks at a time. Nothing wrong with it. And then one time I'll let off the throttle and I pull up to a stop sign and it looks like I'm fogging for mosquitoes. Didn't expect that ending. <laughs> I was expecting something else. Does it, <laughs> where, where, where does it come from? Out the tailpipe? That's what I'm asking you. Okay. Yeah, out the tailpipe. Okay. It's just blue. It smells like oil. Okay. Mm. Well, if it's dumping enough oil to get past what should be an active catalytic converter system and still getting out the tailpipe, there's a lot of oil moving through in a hurry. But it only does it sometimes, right? Just frequently. Yeah, once in a while, I'll drive it sometimes two months, and it'll never do it. And then one time I'll let off the 
come off the interstate and whoosh. Huh. So I was just uh, curious I can't what see, it could be. I can't see anything that would do that and not do it continuously. But they do have a problem with the fuel injectors in those vehicles and the fuel pressure regulators that could do that. And they're dumping fuel and you're getting smoke out the back. Not, is it just super, super? Not oil. Not ra- I mean, is it just doing it very randomly, not very often? But you that know, wouldn't. That's the thing. Not it's letting not, off, It's right? not doing it all the time. The only other thing that could do that is if you're on the highway. Has it ever done it just in town, not after you've been on the highway? Oh, yeah. Okay. Just, on the way to work in the morning. Some mornings I'll drive halfway to work. I step on the gas and a big puff of blue smoke comes out of there. And it ain't gas, it's oil. Well, if, if, it's, if it's coming and going and it's that major, there's nothing I can think of in an engine that would do that. But if it, if it does have oil in there and the converter is just failing as it gets loaded up, it, it could be that the engine's just worn out. You've got valve seals that are, when you, when you get the extra vacuum, when you let off the throttle, it's sucking that down in there. You've got valve seals that are failing. Anything, Russ, if he had a – I would – there again, I can't – Remember, it, it comes and it goes. Yeah, I was just thinking of like an intake manifold or a, a constant. positive crack crankcase vet that was just starting to come yeah. and go, but it wouldn't pull that much oil nope, that quick. No, a constant oil thing, I could, I could easily go to the valve cover, PCV valve, um, intake, uh, those kind of things where, where you'd be getting oil in there or just valve seals. Is but there anything that be, could going. just be clogging up the tailpipe and then it just kind of – No. Wow. No, huh. but if the, unless the, you know if the engine's got a just a ton of sludge buildup in it, and some of those four threes, I have seen them that way. So what should Joel do? It may not be draining. The oil may not be draining down out of the valve covers back into the crankcase, and it might be getting up high and then pulling it in through valves. One more question, quick. No more question. Does it burn oil? <laughs> Are you putting oil in it? <laughs> yeah, it goes through a little bit once in a while. How much is a little Just bit? When it's smoking blue. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, you got a problem inside it. <laughs> That'll do it for this hour of the Under the Hood Show. 866 594 4150. The Under the Hood Show is brought to you by Sturt Events. Automotive Inc. Now, let's go under the hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood Show from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Glad to have you with us. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Thanks for joining us under the hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to take your calls at 866-594-4150. We've got uh, some people on hold waiting to get on, so let's get right back to the phones and say hi to Roger. You're on the end of the hood show. Roger, what can we do for you? Good morning. I'm a throwback because I'm so old. My daily driver is a 1985 Chrysler Fifth Avenue 318, and it has something in the air cleaner called electronic fuel control, which I believe is a primitive computer control. I've noticed that the uh, distributor does not have a vacuum advance, for instance, and the carburetor has a couple of electronic modules on it. My question, in short, is would it be possible to roll back to a non-electronic controlled carburetor and then maybe put on something along the lines of a Pertronics electronic distributor with vacuum advance and electronic ignition and in case that uh, computer should go out uh, eliminate it from the mix. I'm, we're both sitting here looking at each other, figuring which route we're going to take in the answer first. I'm but... familiar with that car. It, it's yeah, it's a it's a it controls spark, controls fuel. You certainly can. It's possible to yank the distributor out and take the carburetor off and put a put a Holly four barrel on there and a plain old distributor, electronic ignition Chrysler distributor that's not computer controlled. And make it work. Then you're back to old school, and it'll 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 work just fine. It's it's not. Those things weren't the greatest for emissions, anyways, and wouldn't comply with <laughs> most anything. Probably far from compliance now. So you could probably get it to run better and cleaner by 
by running the just a carburetor and and distributor on it, you could go crazy with it and and spend extra money and put fuel injection on it and electronic ignition control. But that's a that's a lot of dough. And you know, as 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 I get older, I kind of look at some of these things and I think, do I want to spend that kind of money on this car, or would I rather just throw a four barrel on it and a distributor, save the money, and then maybe buy something else too? So now I have two. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, it's up to, it's up to you what you want to do. But yeah, you can go any route you want. You know, that's that car is just the old Chrysler V8. That's a that's a pretty sturdy car. Got my first ticket from one of those cars, like, not not driving it. The the officer okay. pulled me over driving one of those, and he happened to be the school officer too. That's how, <laughs> that's how I knew who he was. But the uh, those cars were they were strong and solid, like the Caprice, like the LTD. They just don't make them like that anymore. They were those things were just about bulletproof vehicles. But your recommendation is to maybe get like an Edelbrock manifold and then a. Probably four barrel. Um, if if it was if it was my car and I was changing it over, I'd buy an Edelbrock manifold, buy an Edelbrock carburetor, put that on there, and a, just a standard distributor. That's what I that's what I would change you. I'd be afraid that that old electronic ignition and spark control that spark control they had would just is going to die any day because we had we had problems with them back in '86 and '87 exactly. when these cars were a year <laughs> and two old. They were having problems, and we were swapping out. We'd grab the whole air cleaner and plug them in, swap the whole thing out. You can get lucky sometimes that if you go to our, one of our partners, Cardash Part, and look, you can still find those units for people that might be driving one of these cars. They still work. Not a bunch of them, but they're out there. So you can you can find them. But that would be something that um, if it's not broken now, at least you know you have a plan that yep. you, you could uh, quickly and not too expensively get that car going again. Roger, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. Let's go to California and talk to Joel. You're on the end of the hood show. Joel, what can we do for you? Uh, it's actually Josh, but uh, thanks a lot for taking my call. You bet. Um, I just wanted to get some advice from you guys. I have a 2020 Toyota Tundra TRD Sport. Having a bunch of issues with it. It's at the dealership right now getting some work done. Um, so yesterday I was uh, driving on the highway, and uh, it's got like 8,000 miles on it. Basically, it was a little bit of a bumpy road, and my steering wheel was shaking really violently. Um, it wasn't while I was braking or anything, um, and that was when I was driving to the dealership to take it uh, to drop it off to get the work done. And uh, when I, whenever I hit like a small bump in the road, it just it feels like the bottom's like dropping out. Like you hear the bump stops hit, and you know I took it to the dealership, and they're saying that. There's nothing wrong with it, and that the shocks aren't leaking or anything like that. However, uh, they had to replace the uh, the top bushings for the mount for the rear shocks for the top uh, where where uh, nuts on. And um, I'm just wondering, maybe that might have something to do with it or not. And um, also, whenever I put it in um, four wheel drive, basically the rear wheels start locking up, and you just hear it like a jerking motion, and it's like you know it's basically locked up and like almost like the emergency brakes like connected or something's wrong with the drive shaft. Um, do you have any uh, advice for me at all? When you're in a straight line, it feels like it's locking up when it's in four wheel drive. Yeah. Basically I just went to reverse and as soon as I would put it in reverse, it basically was like a bump, 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 bump. And it was like, I had to like push on the accelerator super hard just, just to back up. Well, okay. I'm, I'm going to want to, just get a couple pieces of information before. This truck is a 2020 Tundra, 8,000 miles. Is it all original? It's all original. Nothing. Well, I mean, I haven't done anything to it. It's the only work that's been done to it was when uh, they put the TRD package on it from the port after they received it from the port. Correct. But that, that's all I wanted to know. I just want to make sure it didn't have larger tires and rims or a lift kit or any sort of after factory um, stuff. No, basically it came with the 18s, but when they do the TRD package on it, they put the 20s on it. But that's all factory approved stuff. They have a they have that's, a process for yeah, that. That's this all. Is, I haven't I haven't put any third I haven't put any aftermarket products or third party products on it at all. Okay, I just wanted to confirm that piece before we went forward. And as far as the four wheel drive system goes, I know Russ is thinking the same thing that that sounds unusual. If 
I think him and I were both thinking that it, okay, if this thing's on dry pavement and it's turning, maybe it's binding up because it's got you know it just has. And he's owned it for a while, yeah, so he'd he'd know that. Yeah. So, but in a straight line, if it's binding up, the only thing that'll bind up in a straight line when it's in four wheel drive and not in two wheel drive is if you have tires that are worn to a, a greater extent on one end front or rear than the other, like a lot. Like if they were worn a quarter inch difference, when you start rolling, you get move a couple feet and it's going to start to bind up and drag either the front or the rear end. The other thing is transfer cases. We've put a couple of transfer cases in these that just. They were old. They were older than this, but the same setup. Uh, we did an 18 and 17. So yeah, but I mean, I mean, my point is they, they didn't the have 8,000 miles on them, but. No, but I'm kind of surprised that they failed with like 70,000 miles on them. For a Toyota, that was super rare. Highly unusual. So I'm wondering if you don't have something going on there, but you've only got 8,000 total on this vehicle? Yeah, I just got it in August, and the dealership's telling me that there's nothing wrong with it. And I know there's something wrong with it. I've had to take it. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I was just I had to get some like, work done to it. It's crazy. It is, it is something wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. I, I had to get some work done to it already because the they said a 10 uh, amp fuse went out on the ECU. I didn't have any access to the windows, the air conditioning, like every warning light was on except for the check engine light. I Do didn't you, have any cruise control. I mean, so you're working with a sh with I'm, I'm the sorry. dealer. You're working with a dealer now because it's a new vehicle. Did you used to have a shop you used to go to when you had an older vehicle? Um, I well, basically, I used to work in a shop and I, I used to be a technician. Well, if so. you used to be a tech. Something that would be super, super rare, but if it's binding up when you're putting into a four-wheel drive in a straight line and it's a brand new vehicle, it's not. It's super uncommon. Like I would say probably less than 1%, but it is possible that they have a ratio problem going on between the front and the rear end, and it would work fine in two-wheel drive. But if they, got, if they were putting the thing together and there was one axle ratio in the front and one in the rear, I've seen that happen working at a dealership one time ever and i haven't heard of it any other times but who knows it's possible so i i would check it if you can ask them to drive another one yeah that's the oh, same sure. model as yours and see how it acts when it goes into four-wheel drive if yeah it, show your salesman hey i just bought this from you you know and they should be thankful that you bought it from them and say oh yeah thanks hey let's go hop in another one out in the parking lot put it four-wheel drive and see if it does not do what yours does say fix it or they're gonna say <laughs> You know what? Why don't you trade that in right now? We'll give you. <laughs> we'll give you. Let's go. Come on. More. Let's yeah. do this. Josh, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. Hope you get that taken care of. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. I got a 98 Chevy. Uh, it's got 300,000 miles on it. And um, so I had some issues with the uh, distributor and rotor. I had to... Uh, replace the rotor and the distributor and redo the timing on it and as i was doing the timing um, i noticed that it started to dump oil out of the uh passenger side of the engine and i was just wondering if i should junk it or not <laughs> that's kind of what to a direct, quick ending. No, there is no equivocating we there. went from hey let's talk about this so we got a problem <laughs> should i junk it uh-huh is there a middle ground? Yeah. I don't got much hope for it. Oh, okay. I'm gonna just first of all, three hundred thousand miles. Do you do you know? Is it all original with those kind of miles on it? No, no. Okay, I'm what, thinking like darn near everything's been replaced. All right, all right. And what kind of? Here's the questions we're gonna ask people all the time when they ask about whether or not they should repair a vehicle or if they should fix a vehicle, what they should do. What kind of condition is it in? The overall condition of the vehicle. It's actually in pretty good condition. The body it doesn't have a lot of rust on it. It's mostly highway miles. Well, so the engine's been replaced and the transmission's been replaced. If the vehicle is in good condition, it's not completely rusted out. The corrosion hasn't gotten the best of it because you get a lot of those trucks. They're just so far gone that the rocker panels are gone. The bottom rails that hold the box up are gone. The, they start eating away at the the spring perches in the back uh, where the moisture lays on top, the fuel tank's ready to fall out of it. You know, you just start seeing pretty good carnage in the upper Midwest here as those trucks get old if they weren't cleaned and protected well. 
So if it looks pretty agree, good, yeah. there still is a demand for affordable four-wheel drive pickups. And if they run and work good, they will always bring a certain amount of money. And there's always somebody that likes to have an extra pickup sitting around that they take down to their boat dock or they take down to their farm and they leave it sitting there. I mean, it's just there is people that need those things. And if one of those uses is you using it in that way as a, as a get-around vehicle, I think it probably is worth fixing. But we got to first determine how bad this problem is. So it's running fine. And you started digging into the distributor because it wasn't, or it wasn't running fine, apparently, is why you started digging into the distributor? Yep, yep. The the rotor was had a bunch of rust on it, and I had to replace the uh, I think the ignition coil and the uh, um, a bunch of ignition stuff. So so when did it? But I got it running. It started. What's that? I just say when did the oil come into play again? When did you start noticing the oil? You said. Well, I was adjusting the distributor, you know, turning it a little bit. And uh, it seemed like it was running fine. I had the timing light, and that was it was getting pretty close. And then I turned it off, and I seen a puddle of oil at the passenger side. Well, it's not like there's a big boom, and then oil started dumping out. So With that many miles, it's and if it's starting to show signs like that, yeah, it's probably pretty much done. We, we see those engines, once they pass the 300 mark, you're just you're just buying time. It could go as high as four, which is is a possibility. Well, you think the engine's been replaced for us? Well, it's but when if yeah. it was replaced at one hundred and eighty thousand miles, and you're you're up there, and it may not have been a new one. It could have been a used one at that point with maybe a hundred thousand right. on it. It's hard to say, but you could do a compression check and a leak down test, see what condition your cylinders are in, look at the spark plugs, see what condition they're in. If the spark plugs are all clean, they're not covered in oil, then that oil is coming externally somewhere out of valve cover or an intake or something like that, and those things could be fixed, and then you could hang on to the truck for a while. What do, you, what do you think would cause that oil to dump out after after adjusting the timing? It's it's. Well, if you've moved the distributor, there is a gasket between the distributor and the manifold back there. And if that is torn and it's leaking through there, yeah, it'll it'll dump a lot of you, you can dump oil out of that spot. Can and, you t- can you tell where it's coming from if you trace it back up? Uh, no, I couldn't. Yeah, it could be coming from the base of that distributor. Make sure it's good and tight. If it's good and tight, it shouldn't really leak down there under the distributor. But look at that area, wipe around that area on the base of the distributor and see if it's really oily. If it is, that's probably where it's coming from. I like that you guys have different opinions here a little bit. Well, I, I was going at it from different. I wasn't going quite to, now that if he knows that the, Russ said it, if the problem's internal on the engine, if he doesn't quite know where the engine oil is coming from and it's leaking out of like an exhaust manifold or it's leaking out by the flange of the exhaust or something like that, you most likely have something that broke inside for whatever particular reason when you were putting stress on that timing uh, as you were stressing the engine while you were timing it. But if it's an external leak, but you can check those things. I'll get me back up here. You can check those things. You can look and see, all right, number four cylinder is like an empty hole. Well, that's a pretty good indication where you could have a problem. Right. But if you check your compression or leak down and all the cylinders have, let's say, 130 pounds of compression or something, 120, 115 here and there. Okay, well, that shouldn't make it dump oil, you wouldn't think. So, I mean, he's got to do a little more little more looking. He's got to find out where that oil is coming from and what the internal health of that engine is. Give it at least a, a cursory uh, checkup. Try. And yeah, then give decide it. where to go. Russ, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. Let's talk to Justin. Justin, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hi, I have a 2017 Volkswagen Golf, and I only have about 38,000 miles on it. And over the last 3,000 miles, I've noticed this odd gurgling sound coming from underneath the dash. At first, I was thinking it might have been some type of vacuum hose or some type of vacuum line that might have been getting water in it somehow. But I've checked. I don't hear anything under the hood. Um... It seems to kind of gurgle a little bit after I turn the car off, but I can't seem to locate the sound of where this like gurgling sound is coming from the car. Do you have any idea what type of equipment, especially under the dash, could even make that sound? Does it do it more when you're on like longer drives? 
Only got 38,000 miles. No, I mean, like, if he's going 30 miles versus two miles. Nope. It's the second I turn the car on, I get a gurgling sound under the dash. It's a mouse with great oral Mm -hmm. care. It's it's got a a water pick. I think it's... I think it's air in the cooling system. I think it's just got a little bit of air in there, and you're getting the waterfall sound yep. out of it. That does that does happen. It's important to now. Seventeen, uh, you're looking yep. at almost five model years old now. So depending on the build date, you're getting up to that point where it's time to change the coolant on it. You may have lower miles, but you still got age on it. A coolant flush would not be out of the line on this. And when you do the coolant flush, thermostat, use a good thermostat from like a partner of ours like Motorrad. Um, get it, make sure you have a good one that's good quality like the OEM quality. And, it, well, here's the thing about Volkswagens. If you were to take them out, some people take them out thinking, well, I'm going to take thermostat out. And it'll cool the engine better. Actually, no. Volkswagens and Audis need a thermostat in, and they need a good cap on them if the cap is leaking a little bit and not holding pressure like it should again motor red for the cap but if it's not holding the pressure good it also so it, it allows a vacuum in pressure out it you'll start to build, get that air gap in the heater core and when that happens it will it'll gurgle because it's got it's cavitating you're getting air in there so Coolant flush, we vacuum them down to add the coolant in to make sure they're full. So we're vacuuming the air into a negative um, position, and then we're filling the coolant back in by having the vacuum tube pull the coolant back into the car. So it's completely full, takes care of the air gaps in there. I think that's what's going on. And a, a technician that's experienced with that could just listen. You could start it up, they could listen and say, that's exactly what it is. You give it a little gas, and that little sound gets a little louder and then may go away or may continue, but it may just be a little louder. That's the sound of, uh, that's the sound of air in the system. Just, just get a loud stereo. Just turn it up. Eat a, yeah, bigger, just, eat a bigger breakfast. Yeah, just turn it up a little bit. It could be your stomach. Justin, thanks very much for the call. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. if you're not trained. There's a lot of really good places that are looking for ASC certified master technicians, factory trained technicians, Universal Technical Institute technicians, UTI.edu. They're mm-hmm. looking for them. So check them out today. What's a, what's a, this is too broad of a question. What's a, what's a guy make when they start it these It depends days? on where you yeah. go, what part of the country, and how well you were trained. Yeah. What specialties you the, have. The, the sky is the limit if you're good, if you want to improve yourself. And there's more to working on cars than just turning wrenches. If you want to be a good tech, you have to have a great attitude. If you don't, you need to work at it. You need to know that when you're working on stuff, if something doesn't go right in the car, you have to, you have to say, okay, it's just a car. How can I make this better next time and use that? down the road. I mean, I'm still learning after working on cars for well over 30 years. Uh, It's, it's a, it's a process and you want, you want to continue to, if if you look at a tech and all they're doing is they come to work, they punch the clock to come in and they turn a few wrenches, they get frustrated with it all day. They clock out and go home. That's probably what they're going to do for a long time. But other techs are constantly learning but there there's a balance too you don't want to be the tech that says i spent all night looking in the books and trying to figure all these things out like okay now you're getting too good for your own good you get there's a there's a fine balance there's a lot of to, great techs out to answer there. your question depending on the market you're in and the setup of the shop that you're at and you know what kind of inventory they work on what kind of repairs that they do 
all those things matter, but you're going to see wages in this region that we know about anywhere from effective wages of $15 an hour that could bounce up to $35 an hour okay. you know, when you look at the effective because there's a lot of different pay plans that people have, the amount of hours that are worked. Sure. So it's really hard to compare because That's there's bad, some yeah. people that work into a – place where they're doing a, a, a solid 40-hour work week and that's it. There's other people that we talked to that have came out and we're talking to them about employment, not just for the repair facility, but even for our dismantling facility. And they've been working somewhere where they're putting in a 65-hour work week. Well, their total paycheck, because overtime is very high, but their <laughs> effective wage per hour when you start breaking it down, and they want to work less, but yet they don't want to give up the money that they've right. been making by doing all the overtime. So it's kind of a And a lot a of those are are short-lived it's like oh we get all this overtime for two months and then they have nothing and they're sending them home early so when you look at the total number at the end of the year the guy that kills himself trying to do those extra hours may actually be making a little less or the same as the person who just has a good steady year and a good employer and when it comes to skill or attitude you got to have one or the other so if you're kind of a jerk and you go to uti.edu and get the skills then you're you got to be you got to get one of those really way up there Let's go to Pennsylvania and talk to Tom. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Tom, what can we do for you? Hey, guys. How you doing? Thanks for having the show. I listen all the time. Get a lot of information from Thank you. Me. Thanks. So I got a 17 Yukon. With, started with intermittent, no start, no crank. Put, fixed some ground wires in a starter. That lasted a few months now. It conks out going down the road. The door locks go up and down on their own. The tailgate will close by itself. So I found a service bill in 5586G. I just wondered if Russ had any experience with any of this stuff. We've had we've had a lot of that body style. Yukon, the Denali's, Suburbans, Tahoe's uh, with body control module issues. Uh, and, and more than I like to see for that that newer body style, but right, right in that generation of this truck, uh, they're, they're a pretty good vehicle. The engines seem to have been pretty good, but we've had some weird body issues go on. And most of the ones that we've ended up preparing have been a body control module that we've replaced. It's got to be diagnosed, but it's super hard to diagnose. You just, sometimes the problems aren't occurring um, to test them to see if they're fixed after you could spend all day diagnosing it and say, well, I think it's a computer, but there's no way to really point to it without replacing the part. Then you put the part in and hope that that fixed it. You know, you just you, you just don't know in, in some of these cases, and it's an expensive guess. But once you see enough of them, you can, you can kind of follow along those lines. And we haven't seen anything with the new generation now. It's so new that we haven't, they haven't been out there long enough to find out what the bugs are in those yet. But in yours, it's very possible it's that body control module. And that's the discussion you have to have with your repair person. Say if they go ahead and, and they test it and they say, you know what, this vehicle's not acting up right now. We tested the systems on our normal test that doesn't take very long, and we don't find anything wrong with this vehicle right now. But we believe I, we believe my... you that you're having these symptoms. Mm -hmm. So based on, you know, we didn't look up that service bulletin, but based on this particular information, we're gonna do this. Right. Are you okay with that? It's gonna cost this much money. We're gonna right. do this. But we can't guarantee this is going to fix the problem because we didn't experience or find anything wrong. And so you were going to say something. I cut you off there. That's a, Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. My regular mechanic was honest enough to tell me that. Trying to find someone that specializes in the diagnosis, but then I have to make the decision. Well, and then even if you find, and just to reiterate, I'm repeating for everybody, including myself, because I have to hear this myself sometimes, even the best technician depending on how much time you're going to pay them for to look, if they don't find the problem occurring, many, many times you're, you're wasting money. Um, if you really want them to go after it, they can go and they can start tracing wires physically uh, with tools. They can look at connections, start pulling things apart, putting them back together. And we are in an era now, and we just were discussing this at the break off the air, you're not going to find many places that are just going to spend half the day looking at your vehicle and not charge you for it. Right. No. It's just, it's just that, that, you know, yeah, we look for a while. Yeah. I just want you to take it home because there is low demand or low supply 
of and high uh, demand of uh, and high oh, demand. Sure, yeah. And so you you just can't get stuck on a vehicle and not yeah. be and not be paying for the paying the bills. The right. supply of shops and what they can get done versus the stuff is you know like at our shop it's it's busy all the time and there's typically you know we've got f- anywhere from forty to eighty cars on the lot at any one time that are continuously turning over and turning over. Well, if you took even ten percent of those a day and said, nah, I'm going to spend an hour here and just do it for free. What well, you're, you're going to right. keep going behind, you know, and the shops just, some of them are, are really drastic on one and they'll just say, you want me to touch it? It's 200 bucks. I'm not even going to look at it. If it's electrical, I won't well, even bring I, it in the door. Yeah, we've got a good customer of ours. That's, that's the way they operate. They say, you know what? It, our, our standard rate is this much. Um, that's just getting to touch the car. And then after that, they charge, you know, by the hour for what they're doing, and that's and they'll they'll give you the roadmap of what it's going to look like, and this is your choice whether you want to do it or not. Mm-hmm. Tom, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. Doesn't sound it's not perfect, but it's it's just the only way forward. Yeah, on it'd be, it'd like be interesting if we do that exact service bolt. We could look that up and see what they're saying because I'm guessing that's going to at least give him. Like I said, he's he's already got a clue. Let's go to Iowa and talk to Jarris. Jarris, you're on the Under the Hood show. What can we do for you? Hey, uh, I got a 2016 it's a 6.7 diesel. And um, a couple calls back, a guy called in, and he said that he had a vehicle that was about that same age, didn't have very many miles on it. Um, mine only has like 19,000 miles. I was kind of curious, uh, should I change any other fluids for maintenance-wise besides the oil that I always change in regular intervals, or should it be fine for quite a while, or how often should I change, like, the coolant and stuff on something like that? What are your miles on it now? 19,000. Uh, I only got ni- 19,000 on it right now. Okay, but you've got you've got enough age on it. With the diesel, it's, it's even bigger because of the temperature changes with your coolant uh, than gasoline engines you'll still have it in gas when you when you get some age on it but i would edit with a 16 i would flush the coolant out if are do you tow with this when you drive when you've got less miles on it but are you pulling heavy stuff with it campers or anything um i no i've done a few things where i pull a fifth of gooseneck trailer but not very much it's just for driving around okay. just for fun kind of i guess but. so so not regular <laughs> it's a weird um, kind of fun <laughs> no not regular no yeah well a, a 16 i'd say it's time to change you know change your engine oil of course regularly you've got to be changing the fuel filters on these things it's super super important to protect the injection system on it so they need to be changed what a lot of people don't realize um now here's I could just throw this out. So Chris, you oh got boy. a you got a car you put a thousand miles a year on. Okay. And I, I changed the oil on it. Let's say I changed it two years ago. You put a thousand miles on it. So yeah, you got less than two thousand miles, but you pull the dipstick out and it looks like brand new. You can't tell it difference between that and what's in the bottle. Would you change it? Yeah, I I think I would change it. At least annually. You, well, and you get it out on the road. Yeah. You, you, when you take it out on the trips, you take, let's say, five trips a year, but you get it out, you drive it for two hours, and then you pull it in and shut it off right away in the garage, and it Boy, still looks like brand new. Maybe not if it's a F-250 and the oil change is going to cost me a bunch of money. Here's where the trick question comes in, Chris. If you throw a piece of cardboard in a puddle of oil and let it sit there for two years, what's it going to look like? Your filter's made out of cardboard. Oh, sure. Your fuel filter, your oil filter, your air filter. Air filter is not subjected to the moisture. Oil filters are. During the COVID problem, mm-hmm. it was a problem, still is, uh, we had a lot of people that didn't drive their cars. They stayed home. They'd been home over a year, and they didn't change their oil. And they said, it's your filter. We've seen some filters that have come apart. Because they're not, they do sell extended drain filters for that purpose. But if it's a standard filter, you got to think about that. So fuel filters, flush the coolant, uh, change your oil. And, you know, I think other than that, keep an eye on the other fluids, make sure they're full, but should be fine. Jarris, thanks very much for the call. That was a good trick question because I wouldn't have thought of that. And it's really not a trick. It's just the way it is. The cardboard just breaks down. And that's why extended drain filters last longer they're made to go longer intervals
We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show, 866-594-4150. Thing. You're going under the hood. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's talk to Todd. You're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you, Todd? Hey, I got a 04 Buick Century. Um, I'm a real mail carrier. And that uh, little vent deal behind where you put the gas in always plugs up. And my, I was wondering if I could just cover that up with a towel so I wouldn't have to, every two months, tear it out of there and clean it out. Would that work or does it screw <laughs> stuff up? No, it won't work. Uh, no. You know, there's certain things you're supposed to fix I mean, in certain I ways. I mean, I thought I could pull it out. You can relocate it. That, just, just relocate the vent for it. That's what they do on a on a on a service Bolton for like a lot trucks. of those trucks and the Yukons and Tahoes and some of the GM stuff. They relocate it to a different spot so they get it out of the path of most of the dust and dirt. Yep. It's just a solenoid and some hoses. You can even use a different solenoid, but you've got a good shop that does that kind of stuff for you. They can run a hose up to the front. They can move the solenoid up there. They can, or they put the solenoid in the back, but they run a vent hose all the way up the front, and they tie it in with the with the air cleaner, and they're pulling clean air into it that way. Yeah, it can be it can be done. All right, I'm going to ask the question other listeners are probably wondering about. Um, with the problem you're having, we all, we've had it discussed quite a few times in the air with the stuff getting all dirty, and you start getting check engine lights on for e- emission problems and things like that. What problem are you having? outside of the irritation you can't put gas in it okay i just want to make i just want to make sure that so you i've had people i've talked to that have taken things into their own hands and then did things that you're talking about it's not emissions proper it's not right and in some vehicles they won't run well at all once you do that if it's doing that you're going to get dirt in the tank exactly you've got a fuel system problem yeah you're going to have other problems but i I do know people that have been so frustrated they've done like a small can and filter i had one guy vented it into his tent into his trunk he goes well there's no dirt in there i was like you you want to really explode he goes it doesn't smell that bad i'm like oh it does smell though (laughs) the fuel vapors are kind of sneaky sometimes but i people have done those sort of things we're not advising it. Well, I was going to leave everything there. I just wanted to cover it up and put like no. a zip tie around it to slow the dirt down. Well, then you're going to work. You're going to get the check engine light. It it just needs to be relocated. They do the relocation kits on the truck and they, replaced. Yeah, right? They I mean, put us. You put a solenoid on back there that has the ability instead of venting right there with this little cap. It's going to have a tube so you can put a rubber hose on it you're on a piece of heater hose all the way up to the front and it vents up under the hood high out of the way or into the air cleaner housing so it's it's that filter housing so it's it's pulling clean air in there you don't want it under the back it's going to be constantly picking up that dirt so he's going to but he needs to doesn't he it's going to cost a little bit of money but if he's replacing this thing everything even two to six months it's he's already twice and he's got the money covered that's going to fix the relocating it here again, I'm just going to say, if you tried what you're thinking about, the Don't. worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to throw a check engine light. If you're keeping the system intact and you tried to put an external filter on it, but we just don't recommend it. What are you doing? I'm just telling you because I, I, I can tell he's going to do it anyway. <laughs> Todd, were you well, going to do it anyway? It's, it's, a ma- it's a mail car. I've always got exactly. a check engine light I, It's on. an 04 Century well, that he's hauling the mail with. He's going to try it anyway. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So... <laughs> It's not going to make the car stop running. He's going to throw a check engine light if it doesn't work. You see a lot of filters that are used in industrial lawnmowers and different things where they put a foam filter around the outside. It's a multimedia, multi-stage filter. He's just going to make his own version of that. I, mm-hmm. I, I would try it knowing that you may end up having a check engine light come on because you've restricted the system. And that, and again, it's an 04 that he's doing. the So... It's not the worst thing in the world if his check engine light is I'm, on. I'm just looking at the situation and right. saying, he's going to try this. I just know he is. <laughs> Todd, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. All right, I saw something today. I have a question for you. And uh, it, the question is how many years, okay? So I want the answer in the number of 3. years. 3.5. 
How many years ago, it was on this date, that Oldsmobile put out their last vehicle off the production line? How many years ago? Can I give you the year of the vehicle? I can't do the math that quick. Oh, is that? Okay, yeah. Go ahead. I believe it was oh. a 2004 or three Oldsmobile Silhouette or Alero. It was 2004. On this date, in 2004, I can't believe it was 17 years ago. It seems like just yesterday we were saying, hey, Olds is done. Yeah. I can remember sitting in the studio talking about that. Wow, that's just. And didn't the last one go up for an auction or something? Yeah, it was like an Alero or something like that. I think it was an Alero. What did they say on that? Little snippet at all? What? Not in the no, one. Okay. No, right, I, right. I didn't read that far into it. I just you know why I remember that for some reason? We had, we dismantle a lot of vehicles that are almost new. And I remember dismantling an 04 silhouette that was okay. a anniversary edition. It was like the last run and it had special embroidered seats in oh, it. Wow. And we thought, boy, they really went over the top on the silhouette van, but it was the <laughs> end of the line. So they were going out with a bang. Let's go to Texas. Talk to Albin. You're on the end of the hood show. What can we do for you? How you doing? I'm not in Texas. Actually, I'm in Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri. Oh, even better. Yes, it is. <laughs> and uh, my question pertains to uh, putting headers on my 2013 Tundra. So how feasible is that? And uh, can it be done where you're still, you know, you're not going to, I wonder if it's going to, is it going to mess up the engine anyway down the road? Uh, what are the benefits or drawbacks to that? Well, that engine's already got a header type manifold on it. Um, not a full long tube header, but um, they're pretty free flowing. They're, they're good the way they are. If you want to put headers on it, I know they do make a lot of aftermarket stuff for the Tundras. Uh, sure you, do. You, yeah, you could put headers on it, a cat back exhaust system, get a little different tone out of it. Um, in you know, change the torque curve a little bit on it, a little more power. But what you spend versus what you get out of it, uh, you could probably buy a nice boat for driving around <laughs> down there. I mean, no, Russ, you know he can't buy a boat because you've been. Yeah, I know it, it's it's going to be it's not that bad. Trying to find a boat, they're expensive. Uh, a boat or a house, anything. They, everybody from the uh, east and west coast are moving out here, and uh, now it's hard to find anything for the local people. So or a yep. tundra. But anyway, <laughs> or a tundra. That's right. That's right. I got my. But I was just wondering, risk versus gain. A friend of mine did it. And he was seemed to be pretty happy with it, I guess. Yeah, um, of course. I don't think but, you're uh, really risking anything. You know, with headers, you you run the risk of having more exhaust manifold leaks, where you have to replace the gaskets and tighten up the bolts more often. But I don't know. You're you're, you're not really going to gain a ton off of that if you use a put a tuner on there. There, as you go, you have to go, almost go all the way. Headers, full cat back exhaust with the factory catalytic converter or a high flow converter that's still emissions legal, and then a tuner, yeah, you're going to gain. You could probably pick up a little bit of horsepower between the tuner and the exhaust. You're going to see some gains. I want to go back just quick here. we got just a little time left. What do you want to gain? Well, I was looking to gain a little more power and gas mileage out of it. You know, I never put headers on a vehicle before, and I know when this went out, right? Actually, I talked to you about lifting it three inches a while back. I did that, and it drives ten times better. Okay, now so let's, much smoother. let's go back to the psychology of this. Your buddy that said he put headers on and it did pretty yeah. good, he will never tell you that it was bad. Right. So, so don't use that as your fact source. <laughs> yeah, that can't be a, a, he'll, a source. He'll, he'll never tell you that it was wasted money and he can't tell the difference. Right. He's going to say, oh, yeah, it's great, because he spent a lot of money. But I, Russ said it, TRD, others, they are starting to make more and more go-fast and fun parts for these, for these Toyotas. I mean, Toyota's racing on Sunday, and they're racing on short tracks and they're mm-hmm. off-road and they're doing all kinds of stuff to raise their bar with the stuff that they have available. But I think Russ hits it pretty much on the head. If you're looking for a sound, a noise, a feel, it's awesome. You'll get some gains, but the cost of those gains, it's debatable. That'll do it for another hour of the Under the Hood Show. The Under the Hood Show is brought to you by Sturdivant's. Facebook, if you're podcast, I mean, if you're, stuff. but if you're listening right now, right, you know that. I mean, that's, I don't have to tell you that you're hearing us. So 866 594 4150. 
What's caught your guys' attention in the automotive world? Uh, well, you've heard us talk about the changing of prices, and everything is just getting wacky. I had to make a, uh, I got some family stuff going on, and I had to make a reservation. Uh, flights, pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, these are, these are great. They're on sale. And then I had to get a rental car. And my rental car is $120 a day yeah. for the cheap car. It's typically it's like, like a Yaris. <laughs> 30, 30 bucks a day. So I'm listening to the news and I had to look it up. Chris, you got the computer over there. Look up what rental cars are going for in Miami right now. Try to rent one for one day, any car, any kind. Okay. See if you can find me a car for under $300 a day. Oh, geez. So this is what happened. During COVID, rental car companies said, we're not renting any cars. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? We sell off the fleets. That's what you do. The largest buyer, you know what made the Taurus the number one selling car in the United States? And the Impala is such a hot seller. Fleet sales. Fleet sales. Yeah, exactly mm -hmm. what Shannon says. The rental car companies bought them up in droves. And they sell them the same way, so you can get great deals. So they buy all these cars, then they sell all these cars. Remember the big rental car fire? Oh yeah, during oh, yeah. the pandemic, where they had a whole field of them burn up. Everybody was kind of wondering what's that all about. And they about? didn't get replaced because they didn't need them. So why yeah. get them? Well, what's happening now? There is a big shortage on brand new cars. There is a shortage on used cars. The rental car companies aren't going out and buying used cars, so they're short. So there's no no cars. Fort Lauderdale, Miami, Orlando, they're all short on cars. <laughs> Ford uh, just announced, you know, their their quarterly earnings, and they were really really big. But they said, watch out next quarter; it's going to be just slashed because semiconductor shortage is just nailing them hard. Mm -hmm. uh, the production ability is just nailing them really 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 hard. You know what you got to do, Russ? You got to go Turo. There you go. What's, oh, I should look that up. Yeah, I'll look it up there. Uh, rental by owner, just like an Airbnb. You yeah. got people that have extra vehicles, and they rent them out, and you can rent somebody else's car. I have to go to, uh, have to get a, uh, uh, I was going to say a YouTube. I have to get a, I'm going to have to get a YouTube to the house. No, that would be a, why is my mind escaping? That's all right. You'll, you'll come back to you, but know that. A Lyft I, or I have, an Uber. Yeah, I have yet to use, right there to I have get yet to, to use Turo, but it is becoming very popular, they said. Chris found me a because. Tesla one time and a Lamborghini. Mm -hmm. He says, hey, why don't you rent one of these on your trip? And I thought, That's right. eh, okay. Well, you don't have to rent fancy stuff, though. They do it with just regular stuff. I bet what, I, you, uh, what, what? Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. No, because then he'll no. be spending more money than he was complaining about getting the the. Sprint. We don't care how much he spends. If he's going down there, we and care. Using, if he no, we not about. We don't care. About <laughs> Shannon's you. pay. He said he'd pay my next rental car we bill. We don't. <laughs> when they were thirty bucks. If a day. you're going to go Turo, you get the you get the Maserati. Yeah, that's what I think you do. Let's talk to Richard in Idaho. Richard, you're on the Under the Hood show. What can we do for you? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I watch your. I listen to your show all the time. And I really appreciate your advice. Thanks. I'm a 76-year-old veteran. And uh, Thank you. <laughs> I've been driving since I was 16. Uh, <clears throat> I've been with AAA that long. <clears throat> and I'm uh, getting ready. I live in an apartment. I'm getting ready to uh, travel the U.S. and uh, live in either a Class B motor home or a truck and a camper, and I'm trying to make up my mind which one is more reliable. I've seen a lot of nice Class B motor homes, but most of them are overseas, and you really can't find any good dealers around Idaho and, or with inventory. The best one I've found is in Fort Worth, Texas. So I need your advice. What do you think would be more reliable would be a truck and a camper or a class B motor home. Well, here's, here's the thing with a motor home. It drives you where you want to go. You're there, you're parked, you're kind of stuck unless you want to take the motor home and go somewhere, unless you're pulling a car, a smaller car behind it. Motor. So you can do that. Scooter. Richard, how are you on scooters? <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> then your second, choice is to go there with the fifth wheel hooked up, unhook it, 
drive your truck around, which is going to be a, a large vehicle to get in and out of parking spaces. Doing wherever. the tail of the dragon with your yeah. F-350. Yeah. So <laughs> if, if you do have a full-size motorhome, you can get where you're going, take your car off from behind it. And if it's a smaller car and you're going to these small, let's say you go up to New England states, I would want to take a Jeep or a smaller car. You know, if I'm if I'm older, I don't know if I want to be jumping in and out of the Jeep, but, you know, a smaller car. And you can go through these towns. You can drive through the smaller roads and get in and out quickly, do your shop and do what you need to do. If you're up in the mountains somewhere and you have to take your, your truck and unhitch it, you've got a big F-250 or something like that, you unhook it from your from your fifth wheel and you have to drive into town, even going to Walmart or something, you're pulling into these shopping areas and, and you're, you're going to try to find these smaller spaces, probably going to have to park a little further out. It's going to mean a further walk. So those are things to consider. Uh, they're both going to run, should run equally well. Uh, a lot of times, if you're, if you're buying a Class B, you can get decent power in those if you're buying a little newer one. Um, if you're, if you're not buying a brand new one, if you're buying a brand new one, you can get all the power you want. But if you're not buying a brand new one, you'd almost be better off. You got the truck then you got a hitch and you got all that stuff to deal with. Um, I've got a camper that goes behind the truck and where I get, when I get where I'm going, it's kind of frustrating for me sometimes to sometimes I just leave it connected the whole time. But if I've got to go somewhere while I'm there, I've got to unhook it. Sometimes there's not space on the pad to park and it just can be it can be I find myself wishing sometimes I had a motorhome and then other times I think I'm glad I have a truck so it, it it's going to be personal how preference. big how big of a motorhome are you looking at I know the class you're talking about but how, how big are you talking well I saw a really nice motorhome uh Swift by Jayco it was uh 22 foot and it was uh it was eighty nine thousand dollars but I couldn't find a dealer with it. Problem is, I can't find a good dealer that has a, a good inventory of motorhomes in the western United States. Yeah, the inventory is so them. low right now. That can't one find them anywhere else. Either. Talking about in Texas, it's got to be the one I'm thinking of. There's, a, there's one there on the interstate that is ginormous. I mean, they've got well over 1,000 campers and motorhomes typically most of the What's time. The I don't know what that one's called. I see it every time I drive by down there, going going in and out of is, town. Is that in Fort Worth? Yes. Yeah, that's the one I heard about. Yeah, it's it's it. absolutely huge. I mean, you you come up on it and you you drive like a quarter mile as you're going down, down past the lot there, <laughs> across the, by the casino. It's it's a it's a monster, but they've got a lot of stuff new, used, going in and out there. But yeah, like you said, it's amazing what motorhomes can run you if you buy a like a sprinter chassis motorhome whoa some of those are you know 130,000 bucks 140,000 bucks Richard why right. get one of those cars with the tents on top like get a Honda Element with the tent do some overlanding yeah 69 Volkswagen bus there you go <laughs> I have a 2001 Chevy truck it's got a 4.8 it's got tow hold it's got a really nice hitch I have a cover on the back the inside's immaculate. I bought it off an old man uh, for five thousand dollars. I put a new set of tires on it. I get twenty-five miles to the gallon with Jeez. it. And I was thinking I'm going to get a Scamp trailer, so I called Scamp in Bacchus, Minnesota, <laughs> and they're two years behind. <laughs> they're yeah. two years behind, yeah, and don't... and I said, well, I, I'm a retired electrician. Uh, union, IBEW, and among other things. And I said, well, I'll just go to work for you. He says, well, I was talking to the guy at a long conversation. He says, we have 70 employees in a little town called Bacchus, Minnesota. And he says, yeah, we got lots of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you got you you know the situation. And it's, it's right now, making these decisions now is very hard um, because – if you're going to find something, if you if they don't happen to have inventory on hand, you've got to be watching social media and striking right when this stuff comes up for sale, mm -hmm. when somebody puts something up for sale. I'm going to predict in about three years, we're going to have a glut of used inventory for sale because there's going to be a lot of people right. that, that have bought 
campers and and motorhomes and other stuff. They're gonna find right. out. They're gonna find out what it costs to not use it, right? And and how much they actually get out and use it. There's gonna be avail- availability issues at campgrounds, and uh, those prices are up yeah. there this and year they, too. Everybody's got this vision and this this utopia of getting in their camper and showing up at the state park, and they've never done it before. And they don't realize that you've got to be up at midnight when the state park reservation systems right. open up to get even a, a sniff of a place to park. Yeah. And so the next thing you know, you're in the Walmart parking lot, and I think they're probably getting away f- from that too. <laughs> I read an article recently that they were starting to limit because so, so many people were out there doing it. So I just see that this is gonna this is gonna peak. I feel, and then it's gonna be a backside that there might be some opportunity in. But right now, it is a crazy world in that stuff. Russ, you you hit. I think you hit some really good points for him to think about uh, of how to make his consideration. It's easier to get a pickup repaired mm-hmm. than it is to get a motorhome repaired if right. something breaks I'm, and you're yeah. out on the road. I'm towards a truck. I'm leaning towards a truck and a camper. I'm only five foot four, so you know I wouldn't have any trouble living in a camper and making the best of it. I really want to commend you, gentlemen. You're very well informed, very intelligent. I've listened to you over and over again. I, like I said, I was electrician in construction, among other things. I was a CB in the Navy, and uh, you know, I know a little bit about cars. I've worked on them uh, over the years and done many things. And you men are very well informed, and you're very helpful to the general public. Thank you. I really commend you, man. Thank you. I Thanks very it. much, Richard. And good luck. Thanks very much for the call. Yeah, I think the 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 versatility is huge too i mean if you if you get a motor home you have a motor home and the only thing you can do is try to sell that motor home whereas if you have a truck and a camper you can tr- you can swap out a different camper you can get a smaller or a bigger in a year or two you can sell the camper you still have at worst you you have a truck and a camper and you have that truck dollars and cents wise you have the choices and they're they're all valuable right now you're going to invest to get a good Let's just say a three-quarter ton, at least, you know, pickup, and a nice camper. You will invest as much as you would in a nice motorhome, right. or or one or the other. So there, there's definitely two sides and to where you're going to go with this thing. Right now, on that motorhome, if you have an issue that is not just basically engine and transmission related, so you can go to an automotive service center to have them do the repairs, you may be in trouble. I've got a guy that, that works for me at the shop that has some ongoing issues with a camper, a very large camper that is not very old, so it's still got warranty on it. And his warranty stuff that got repaired, but they're still having problems with that same thing that needed to be worked on, they're trying to work through those issues, but it's taking him months to get the service mm-hmm. work done. Camping it's season in our to, area only lasts yeah. for months. Well, right. he's right. been working on these like through the winter since last October, and he hasn't got a lot of them taken care of because they're busy, but he had a new one come up, and he says, I need this looked at because the warranty is going to expire like in eight months. And they said, well, we're about a year out. Like, what, what do you mean you're a year out? Because mm-hmm. we can't work on it. They said, well, the warranty is going to expire. They said, that's not our problem. They said, your warranty expires, you know, we can't get you in. It's your job to get it into a camping dealer that can get this fixed and contact that, that company. That doesn't even sound right when you company. say it out loud. I know it. Well, it's just becoming that way. And the thing that floors me is. It doesn't make it right either. It's $150 <laughs> an hour for a camper repair place. And I look at that compared to the skill of an automotive shop and the tools required. There are very few tools and the skill level to repair just general camping stuff is way lower, but they have found that since there's not that there's supply and demand, you know, if you took half of the automotive shops out of the realm and the shops were just slammed, they're going to raise the prices sure. and, and get away with it. Uh, but the camping people are, are super high and all the camping places are, are up in that area in at least around this part of the country. But like Shannon said, it floors me. It, took me pulling teeth to get four spaces reserved for the the 2021 camping season in South Dakota. And they were like the last few left. I had a hard time. You know, sometimes it's going to be camping at the mother-in-law's place in the in the backyard <laughs> in the on the acreage because 
there is nothing available. And they're still selling out every camper they get. Like, Where are they going? I wonder, too, Richard made it seem like he doesn't, I mean, a smaller camper makes this whole thing a bit easier and and cheaper, right? I mean, if he's willing mm-hmm. to go to a smaller camper, he can have a smaller truck. You yeah. don't have to have a... His truck's got a 4.3. Well, yeah, I don't know. No, no, 4.8. I don't, I don't know oh, if he was going four, down eight. that road that he was going to try to pull that. He did. He said he wanted to buy the little camper, those camper, yeah. those small camper that would work behind that he half time. He could pull like a, a 16 to 20 foot, just a small... Even a the pop up a high low kind mm-hmm. of if he can find something like that and find out if he likes it right. buy an older one that he could resell for a decent price. But even going with a new truck, if he went with a new truck, he wouldn't have to get an F three fifty if he's getting yeah. a, a new twenty. Because you're going to spend sixty five to eighty five thousand dollars to get a heavy enough truck to pull <sighs> the bigger camp. Right. And the, and the thing we got to remember here, he's not looking to go camping. He's just going to look to see the see the country. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He wants to travel. Yeah. So this is, uh, to me, there might be some different thoughts that go into it. If, like Russ had brought up during his reply, if you're going to just to travel and see the country versus you're going out for a weekend to go camping five mm-hmm. times a year. Yeah. You'll make some different decisions based on that. He should just get an over a, a bed camper, you know, where over the landing. bed's over the top of the truck. Yeah, I know Rodney, our, <laughs> our, uh, one of our sales reps here, he sends me stuff all the time and just... It's amazing that overlanding, the different things that people are coming up with. He showed me one that I looked at him like, really? I suppose, but they had a fold. I, I wish I could remember the name of the company, but it was pretty well done. But they had a fold out like platform that you would put in your crew cab pickup. And it would, it would hang basically like from the, from the handrails up above and it would prop up somehow on the back seat. And, you know, kind of ride, and it's, it made a bed inside the truck that two people could sleep in, one going straight across the back and one on the passenger side with the seat reclined. Hmm. And it made a platform okay. across the interior of the truck. And then it would fold up when you were done, and you could put it in the box. That See, would work. You could just make your own with wood if wood weren't so expensive and hard to come by now. Oh, I love the jokes on the Internet about it. Well, the, inner, the lumber. Oh, let's fun. talk about towing. How much can I tow with my vehicle? Because this guy's got a four point eight in a little in that in that older Chevy truck. You've got to look up. You can get online and you can look up a lot of the camping sites, like Camping World and things. Will have a chart of what these vehicles were rated with from the factory. General, the newer Mo- truck General Motors get. actually has a special supplement they put out. Their towing guy. Yep. So the newer the vehicles, they, they weren't very good 10 years ago. They but now they're actually shake. getting better. So they've all got a great place to look. But you've got to look and see what that weight rating is and tow no more than about 80% of that total. For because, that particular optioned vehicle. Exactly. And don't mess up. I've had this year already people said, I've got an F-150 with an EcoBoost. It says I can pull 11,000 pounds. And I said right away, no, you probably can't. Unless it's got the 410 gear package, the heavy-duty towing package, all that. And sure enough, I ran their VIN number. It said 7,200 pounds. They said, well, I got this truck, and I got a camper that weighs 9,000 pounds. I said, you're already over if you're at the towing package truck. So Mm -hmm. you need to get a smaller camper or a bigger truck. Got to think about those things. Richard, thanks very much for the call. All right. That'll do it till next time. Thanks for joining us. We're uh, doing a little extended version here on the stream. And uh, we'll still be here for a few minutes if you want to just give us a call. If you got something quick to get to, we'll be in here doing some stuff. So feel free to give us a call. 866-594-4150. Otherwise, thanks very much for tuning in. And subscribe, please. And click the notifications button on YouTube. And set your notifications on Facebook if you want to get into that. I, I wouldn't. If, I, if it were me, I would just... I just let it be. Just I just go wouldn't to go do it. Yeah, go to our YouTube channel. Just send notifications on YouTube. Yeah, because that's then where you don't we get all that garbage like you do on. The and other just one. so you know, that's where we would like you to be. That's where we would just rather say it like have it is. You. Yeah, if we if we had our druthers, we would rather have you watching the YouTube feed. They don't have all those privacy issues yeah. like you do on the <laughs> other. Ah, uh, Russ, yeah, you know, they, no, no, yeah, no, that's no. sure. Yeah. They never monitor nah, anything. No, they no. won't suggest that you watch mm-hmm. certain things. And never, just watch never. what they suggest. <laughs> what could go wrong? That'll do it for the end of the hood show. Thanks, everybody. Take care.